All right, and next slide, Genesis, please. All right, so throughout today's presentations, we'll be utilizing Slido. Um, and this will ask you some poll questions and also offer you a, a, a chance to collect questions that you might have for our panelists. So please right now on your phones or in a separate window on your computer, whatever you're most comfortable with, uh, visit slido.com and then enter the event code, which is SWC panel. Uh, this uh, to help familiar side, uh, familiarize yourself with Slido if you've never used it before, we'd actually like to start with a poll question. Um, and in uh, in response, um, so you you will see the poll question when you open up Slido.com and enter uh, that code word SWC panel. Uh, and we want you to answer the question: What are you hoping to learn today? All right, so I see the answers starting to pop up. I'd like to learn more about how to get started in this path. Absolutely. More about social services and career, your career path. Um, learn more about behavioral sciences, psychology jobs, work in the social services field, something related to behavior. Absolutely. What is social services? It's a great question. You guys are putting in some really great answers in here. Looking for more options when it comes to majors, gain knowledge in this topic, um, gain some perspective on what type of jobs exist within behavioral sciences. Absolutely. Um, so with everything that you guys put on there, we're definitely hoping uh, to uh, help you with today's panel and, and answering some of those questions and hopefully give some more insight as to what is available within your field. Okay, um, so throughout the panel discussion, you may find yourself wanting to ask a question, right? We have our panelists and they're gonna be um, answering some questions that we've put together, but you guys may have some questions of your own. So we definitely want you to ask your questions and we've actually set up something within Slido to help you ask your questions. Um, so when you're in the Slido tab that you're in right now, if you switch over to the questions tab, uh, here's where you can pose your own question and then um, an upvote or uh, like other questions you see that others have asked that you would like to be addressed by our panel. So then when we come to the question and answer section in today's panel, um, we'll be able to pull from those questions that come from you all, and then the panelists will be able to answer those questions that you may have. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Chris. Chris is going to be the moderator um, for today's panel. His name is Chris Hayashi. You may recognize him. Um, he's the professor of psychology and behavioral sciences department chair at Southwestern College. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him. Hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be with you, and I look forward to uh, moderating this panel. Randy, did you want me to do the introductions? Yes, if you could please introduce our panelists. Thank you. I see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Hello, once again. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Ashi, and as, as uh, was stated, I am a professor of psychology in the Department of Behavioral Sciences, and I've been at Southwestern College uh, for you know close to 18 years. So maybe I might have seen you in a class or two, and if I haven't, hopefully I will see you soon. So enough about me, um, you are here to learn about our panelists and all the wonderful things that they have to tell you about their careers. So without further ado, I would like to give um, each person the opportunity to briefly say their name, where they work, what they do, um, and then we will hop into the questions after that. So Kathleen, would you care to get us started? 
Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to be here and thanks for inviting me, Genesis. I'm really excited. I grew up in San Diego, grew up down near Southwestern, so close to my heart for sure. Um, my name is Kathleen Dendrink. I am a regional clinical director for Easter Seals San Diego Autism Services. Um, that basically means I get to support a team of about 150 behavior interventionists, program managers, and clinical supervisors who provide in-home services, ABA one-to-one -one therapy for children and families who are navigating life with an autism diagnosis. Um, my primary goal is to keep our region providing the best, um, most effective and compassionate services to as many families as possible, while also you know, supporting our staff in a way that allows them to grow and find satisfaction in their jobs and you know, acknowledge that they're whole people um, yeah, while also still being staff members here at Easter Seals. And that's what I do in a nutshell. Thank you, thank you. Next, we have uh, Chris Dooley. Everybody, my name is Chris. I am a licensed marriage, licensed marriage and family therapist working at Positive Change Counseling Center. Uh, the office that I work at is in La Mesa, but we also have an office in Rancho Bernardo. Uh, basically, I provide individual psychotherapy to a diverse array of clientele uh, for a reason of very different issues like all, all across the board. Uh, I've worked in a few different settings uh, throughout the, my career so far. I also worked with Genesis for a little bit of time, so good to see you. <laughs> And, and yeah, thanks for having me here. And thank you for joining us. Uh, and last, we have Dr. Tao Ha. Hi, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Tao Ha. Um, I have been a professor of sociology at Miracosta. Uh, this is my 15th year. I am also um, a documentary filmmaker and a film advisor. And I also run a social enterprise uh, entrepreneurship thing uh, to uh, as, a, as a form of philanthropy. So I, I love uh, the hustle and the side gigs and we can talk about like what that's like in our, our current modern day workforce. So um, yeah, thank you for having me and, and, and yeah, let's, let's, let's get started. Mm -hmm. a absolutely, sounds like a great plan. Um, and tell you what, how about we go in reverse order? So. Uh, of the introductions. Uh, so Dr. Ha, if you could please, uh, this is this question is for, is for each of the panelists. Um, so we'll start off with Dr. Ha. If you could address what made you interested in this field? Uh, how did you get into this field and profession? And tell us a little bit about your actual career path, highlighting any barriers or obstacles uh, that you overcame that are worth mentioning. Okay, I'll try to make this real short because that those questions could like be like a life story for each of us. But um, I uh, I've always been interested in people, uh, people watching, observation. Uh, my career path was a little bit odd, uh, you know, as being an Asian immigrant. My parents wanted me to be a doctor, nurse, or engineer, and so that was one of my barriers, right? Family expectations, cultural expectations. And even like sociology, what is that? What do you do with it? How do you make money, right? And so it's like money, like uh, prestige. So that's something I had to overcome. And it took me a long time to find this path. And the key was uh, a, a professor who, you know, reached out to me and said, have you thought about being a sociology professor? And I'd never thought about it before. So I think mentorship right, is key, and we want to encourage our faculty to do it, but as students, I want to encourage you to, to find your mentor. Don't be afraid to come up to someone because teachers are dying for you to reach out to them, right, and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about XYZ field. Do you think you have any ideas for me? Do that in your office hours with your professors. They would love to share with you about their knowledge and their experience. And so that's what my professor did for me. And she opened this door for the, the kind of like graduate school path and to be a professor someday. Um, so, so the other thing about sociology was as a minority, you know, woman, refugee, I was born in Vietnam, came to the US, like as a refugee, my parents, you know, didn't know any English in the beginning. I think there's a value in the social sciences that like helps us understand ourselves. 
Um, so one of the thing about the thing about behavioral and sciences is how do we um, capture our experiences, our identities, you know, the, the things that are important to us as an individual, and then how do we connect that to like the world outside of us? So there's a lot of like kind of self-help-ish stuff that helps, you know, that's in our in our 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 uh, this degree path. Um, but th that can be a, a strength for when you go into the workforce, having the ability to connect like these individual experiences to these larger social structures. So I'll stop there and uh, let the other panelists speak. But um, yeah, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, barriers about like, I think in this degree path, uh, like what kind of jobs can I get and how much money can I make? And so that's what we're here to help you with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. And I think that's excellent advice to our students is, is utilize your instructors or professors office hours because I, I believe it's one of the most underutilized resources that we have you know so thanks for that uh kathleen okay um so i also had a kind of wonky way to this current career um didn't know much about always loved people watching i love that you mentioned that tao um people watching, observe, observing. I wanted to be a private eye when I was young. <laughs> um, and I ended up <clears throat> just going to college because that's what people in my family did. Um, took on a ton of student loan debt, um, which I'm still paying off today. So think twice before you do that. <laughs> I uh, applaud you all for going to uh, community college. As a first step, I did not know what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, which led to several major changes. Um, I landed on psychology. It definitely fed into my interest in people and why people do the things they do. But after graduating with a psych degree, I ended up going into the hotel industry, which is also people focused. There's a lot of um, helping experiences and um, you know, lots of customer service in that field. Um, but uh, in 2008, you guys might not remember this, but we all had we had a big crash, um, and the hotel industry definitely took a hit, and I was laid off. Um, so I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. I had had this part time job where I worked with kids in home doing ABA therapy. I didn't really know what it was. The only reason I did it was to get extra income when I was working as as an administrative assistant in the hotel industry. And so I did that for some time, didn't really think too much about it. It was just fun. Uh, the kids were fun. And then I kind of advanced in my career and didn't need that extra income um, as much. So focused on that hotel career. Um, unfortunately, I got laid off and that led me to, what do I do now? Like, what do I do? I applied to so many jobs, <laughs> so many jobs. Craigslist was like my daily uh, a friend, and I got turned down for a lot of jobs. Um, the best one, I think, was a YMCA buddy. I got turned down to be a buddy at YMCA, and I felt like, man, I'm going to put this on my fridge. This is like, I can't be a buddy. They won't let me be a buddy. Um, but thankfully, they didn't, because it led me to get a job at a ABA company. I thought, that was kind of cool. Let me just try it. They hired me and then I was introduced to what ABA can really look like when it's done well and what it can actually do for kids um, when it's done well. And I fell in love with it and realized I did need to go get my master's. Uh, several years later, I did that and have just been kind of working my way um, up ever since. And it's, uh, yeah, so it was kind of an you know, a really low point of my, my uh, career life was getting laid off. And it definitely opened a window to a career that I am so in love with and see myself being in for, you know, as long as I can be. So um, I would just encourage you guys, you know, when you're hitting those road bumps that it really is just like another opportunity to decide what you wanna do. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into this field. Wonderful, excellent advice, thank you. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Chris Dooley. So I moved here in 2005 from Guam with the expectation that I was gonna go and become a lawyer after going to SDSU for my undergrad degree, but 
I knew I didn't want to do that. So didn't really know what I wanted to do, actually. So I undeclared my major my first couple of years in school. And, and then I wasn't I was totally sure what I wanted to do. So I picked a communication major, might have been sociology, and I started to really enjoy what I was learning. And then like towards the end of college, I still wasn't totally sure, like, what can I do with this? And so I went to my career services counselors and they told me like, oh, we took a few assessments and strength finder tests and Myers-Briggs tests and everything just to come to find out a little bit more of like my strengths and some of my values. And something that kind of came up across the board was becoming some form of a counselor. And so my career services counselor kind of guided me through the different types of careers within this field. And I thought going into marriage and family therapy sounded like something that was going to be up my alley. Then I graduated in 2009, and then we had that massive economic crash. And so like, ooh, I got to get a job. And so I worked in a spa for a couple of years and then uh, finished up some prerequisites I had to do because I didn't major in psychology. I had to finish up some psych courses, and I did that through City College and Mesa College. And then after a few years, once I finished that, I went to SDSU for my master's degree, and that was back in 2012. So since then, you know, finished school, did my practicum at a private practice clinic that served the community of City Heights, and then got a job at San Pasquale Academy out of school, uh, working with like youth in the foster care system who didn't have reunification plans with their parents. That was a big kind of like this, not facility, but like community up in Escondido, which was a really cool experience. Uh, after that, I worked with Genesis as a career services counselor for a little bit of time uh, for about a year and a half or so. Really enjoyed that, but I had to finish getting my hours to get licensed because you need 3,000 hours of direct client care in order to qualify for your licensing exam. So picked up a few other different kinds of jobs, passed my licensing exam, and then started working um, after that. Shortly after that, I started working in this private practice that I'm working at now. And that's how I got here. All right, thank you. Um... You know, I think if there's a common theme uh, to the stories of our panelists today is that it's not a direct path to where we are at. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think when I was a student, I always assumed that the people in the front of the room who were teaching me all this stuff or who I saw in these uh, well-established positions knew from the, the time they were born that they knew exactly what they were going to do and that was going to, they were going to make it happen. Well, the reality, I would say for 90% of us, it is, it is very much a lily pad approach. You know, we kind of hop here, hop there, run into this obstacle, bounce off, find a new path. So, you know, I, I think some great advice is, is that you, you never know when your career path will be illuminated in front of you, but you have to have the eyes open and open the doors and take the first step down that path, um, you know, to make it happen. So hopefully that's, uh, that's something that we... We, we gleaned from this, these, or this first question. So thank you. So if you don't know what you wanna do yet, it's okay. You're just like everyone else. <laughs> All right, question number two. Um, in your field, uh, let me make sure I got question two here. Yes, I do. Okay, in your field, what soft skills are important for students to, the, to, do, to develop to be successful in the line of work? And what advice do you have for students to develop those skills right now? Um, maybe if we can start off with uh, Kathleen, we'll mix this up as well. Yeah, um, I think I loved the, um, you know, advocate for yourself, communicate. I think the communication is huge, um, whether that is you know, advocating for what you need in the workplace, um, advocating for what you want to do or what you're interested in, um, opportunities, um, as well as being able to receive feedback and provide feedback. No matter what the position is, you can be providing feedback to your supervisor or a supervisee. Being able to receive and process feedback effectively is such a great skill in my field. It's one of the things I love about ABA is how like transparent we try to be with each other. We try and just really give it to you straight and be very clear about expectations. And I think being able to um, communicate uh, both ways is extremely important in our field. Um, Part of that I think is being able to take people's perspectives. So kind of putting yourself in another person's shoes, maybe the person you're having that conversation with or someone you're having a, a difficult time with, being able to kind of 
take a step, take a breath and think about the other person's perspective, um, I think is also a wonderful skill to have, um, especially when you're working with families um, who are going through a lot. Um, we have a lot of expectations for our families when they're participating in services. And if we go in just with our perspective, that usually doesn't end well. Um, it, you know, it doesn't allow for us to collaborate or, or compromise or anything like that. And that, that's needed all the time. Um, so I'd say those are the, the things that I really look for is that communication and perspective taking. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Ha, same question. In your field, what soft skills are important for students to develop uh, to be successful in this line of work? And what advice do you have for students to develop them right now? Yeah, being an educator, I would say the number one thing, in my opinion, and it's not a soft skill that I think you can learn, but it is that you have to care. <laughs> you have to be a caring person. You have to uh, and, and that's part of what Kathleen said, being able to empathize, uh, consider other people's perspectives, consider other people's views and experiences, even if you've never experienced it, right? Because if we are not able to understand the communities that we serve, whether you're a social service worker, a family therapist, a, a, a serving families with autism, the, that ability to um, empathize and to care is our, our are, are, I think, values, but also skills that you need. Communication, as Kathleen said, I think as a professor, a teacher, an educator, you have to have public speaking skills. You have to be comfortable, right? Speaking in front of an audience. And it's okay to be nervous. I think, uh, I think what is it like? Public speaking is like the number one fear, even more than death or something like that, right? And I'll tell you what, every time, before we got on and you guys were popping into the Zoom, my heart was beating. I was like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. You know, I've been teaching for 15 years and I still get nervous. So it's okay, right, to feel that, but like be confident in your ability to uh, communicate verbally. And if you feel like, well, that's not my thing, you know, be able to communicate in written form, right? So uh, in, in the film industry, writers are in demand, right? Storytelling is in demand. So if you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I wanna be a public speaker um, in the, the film and media industry, right? Being able to communicate in the written form, narrative, storytelling, like that's a soft skill that is, 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 is really powerful. So um, you're like, oh, why do I gotta take this class where I gotta do some writing? Man, take that opportunity to hone your, 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 your ability to be able to get ideas across, right? And I know that like, you know, college, we put these restrictions on you, like, oh, you gotta write an APA and MLA and okay, yes, learn that. But really the, the thing is, how do you get your idea across? I think that's the soft skill. The APA, MLA, Chicago style, that's like the, the technical skill, right? Um, <laughs> I see in the chat, God, the APA. I know, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you what, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an educator, I, when I write academic stuff, I know that there's a way to write academically. And then when I go and write a blog or like I'm writing a review or like I'm, I'm advising someone on a film script, like it's a totally different type of writing and it's really about emotion and 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 and, and understanding people and like relationships and, and and institutions and that's the social behavioral sciences curriculum that's going to help you strengthen that that ability right to like make those connections um, about the world around you so um yeah communication uh, being able to care and empathize, uh, public speaking or writing, and being able to 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 connect dots and 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 communicate your ideas are some of I think the strongest um, skills that you can bring to the table, not just in these jobs but in a lot of jobs. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. Um, and last but not least, same question for uh, Chris Dooley in your field: What soft skills are important for students to develop to be successful? And what advice do you have for students to develop them right now? Sure. I can't really add too much more because uh, those other answers were really thorough. But I can say like, you know, being able to communicate, have strong active listening skills, work on being genuinely curious and put your own preconceived notions aside uh, because you may think you know about somebody else's experience, but then you don't really know until you take the time to listen with, to them and to empathize with them. I think maybe like something that you know, people can do to sort of start to build some of these skills. Oh, another one is like conflict resolution and all that too, because you may experience a lot of that in this field. 
and there's a lot of diverse kinds of jobs within these different forms or ways of study. But something that I think really helped me was getting a customer service job actually, and being able to like take in other people's complaints and work on trying to like fix things for people sometimes when things that didn't necessarily go that well. I think another thing that really helped too is also just going to therapy. If you're interested in becoming a therapist, you know, go to therapy and really see what it's like if you haven't already done that. And then you can also start to learn to sit with your own discomfort, which makes you more equipped to sit with the discomfort of others, which, you know, you got to do a lot of in this field. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm glad you, you mentioned uh, conflict resolution. That was one thing that hadn't been said yet. Um, if I could add one thing, uh, you know, as a, in any job, I think that we do is working effectively with others. Um, and that can be a challenge because not everybody is an easy person to work with, right? Um, so any job that any of us have, uh, you, we're working with other people, you know, to share my own path. I share the same path as, as our panelists here. Man, I, some of the most important lessons that allow me to be a good educator were came from being a basketball coach, be, came from being a waiter in a, in a restaurant, which I believe everybody should be required to do for at least a year of their life, right? Um, not getting a job at Abercrombie and Fitch when I applied, you know, and, 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 and working in a fishing business. So all kinds of stuff. You never know when these, these lessons will pop up, um, but learning opportunities are all around you no matter what you're doing. You never want to know when they're going to become valuable later. So thank you. And uh, let's see, our third question. How do you keep current with new ideas and or technologies in the ever-changing career and field? Um, let's see, let's go backwards. Chris Dooley. Yeah. So how I keep current, one, we had to all learn how to use Zoom and telehealth platforms because we were all forced to last year. So you know, didn't necessarily choose it, but it found its way to us. Uh, as far as training and staying current goes, I usually take a few training courses throughout the year. The place that I work offers numerous trainings for free. Uh, so I think in doing that, you really like get to hone your interests and you get to choose like what you're most interested in. So you can kind of pick more of like how you're going to develop. And I think that's something that like the private practice side of the field really kind of affords because you really get to pick like what you're going to continue to do rather than you know when you're working in particular places you have to sort of conform to what they need you to do and what you need to learn there uh, so i usually take several trainings throughout the year try to see what's a new thing that's coming up be subscribed to uh, psychology today um, magazine and different marriage and family therapist publications just so you know what's coming up because it's important to stay current and do some new stuff too Thank you. Same question, Dr. Ha. How do you keep current with new ideas and our technologies in the ever-changing career and field? Well, in teaching, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, magazines, journals, workshops, webinars that we're constantly asked to do. And if you work for a community college, and I believe in at the university, university, one of the expectations of your job is that you'll spend time uh, getting continued training, right? We call it professional development. And so that's how I get, you know, my training is it's required and, and the college puts on lots of workshops and, and webinars um, and, and uh, conferences, right? Going to conferences, uh, you know, they can be fun too because you get to travel and like go out of town and like eat uh, these restaurants and stuff. So um, there's definitely a perk, but the, the value of going to those conferences is to learn how to be a better teacher, learn how to be, learn more about sociology in the field so that we can share that knowledge with our, our students. Um, so it's already built in. But as a sociologist, um, you know, I think that, that knowing the breadth of society is really hard. Right. So I actually like to get on Twitter and look at what's trending. I right? look at the hashtag and then what's trending. What's the, what are, what is, what are people out in the world interested in? What's making the news? Um, and it could be anything from sports to politics to um, science discoveries. Like just last night, I feel, realized that the scientists discovered a dog sized uh, scorpion, underwater scorpion in the, that existed 400 million years ago. It was like, whoa, and there was these pictures of like, and so 
I don't know, maybe that's just random information, but I'm like, that was fascinating. Maybe I can learn something about archaeology and like share that with a student might one day who might be interested. And I'll say, hey, oh, did you know there was this sea monster, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? So I think as a teacher, you also want to have a lot of breadth of knowledge so you can connect with your students when they have interest. And so um, to answer the question, it's built into my career. And as a professor, you're expected to do uh, training for your, your job. Um, and then like for myself, I, I again, I just like social media uh, because I wanna know what's going on out there. And the hashtags and the trends to me are an indicator of what society is interested in. All right, thank you. Um, Kathleen, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, we do have two more questions and I think we're doing all right on time. Uh, Genesis, okay. let me know. Yeah, um, so I'm, along with my director position, um, part of the requirement of that is being a board certified behavior analyst. So um, I've been a BCBA uh, since 2013. And um, that keeping that credential up requires that ongoing education as well. So we have specific continuing education requirements that we have to do every two years that we submit. So that is an awesome kind of, expectation that keeps me on my toes as far as needing to access more training. Um, and then the other thing is this job, uh, this field, you never stop learning. You never stop learning, <laughs> which is probably why I've been here for so long um, and why it kept my interest is there's always a better or new way to do something. Um, ABA is a relatively new field. And we have grown so much in the last, you know, since its founding. Um, and especially in the last few years, I think the interest in, personally, I've been trying to listen to more autistic voices. Um, so making sure I'm listening to the people we serve and I understand their perspective. So a really great way to do that is social media. Um, there's an awesome TikTok, actually autistics TikTok account um, that I follow through Instagram because I'm old and I'm not on TikTok. Um, and also there's a lot of Facebook groups. If you are willing to access Facebook, there's a lot of great Facebook um, groups. One is um, ABA Alliance for uh, with Autism and Ethical Impl um, Implementation. Uh, it's very wordy, but there's a lot of great groups that help me access the voices of the people we serve. You know, there's been this um, kind of growing social media um, uh, opinion of, from people who have received ABA services that it is abusive. And that is a very serious um, claim, and we have to listen to that. And if we're not willing to grow and change and, and learn, um, we're not going to be able to serve the people we're hoping to serve in the way that is meaningful to them and makes sense for them. So um, learning and growing is an absolute requirement of this field. And um, another great way that I get my um, info is through podcasts. Um, there's so many great podcasts, behavioral observations is one if you're sp specifically interested in the ABA field. Um, they interview all different sorts of uh, professionals in the field, and it's a really cool, interesting um, uh, podcast. So I would highly recommend that one. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice about staying current is, is the podcast these days. You can do it while you're taking your walk around the neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think the message for our students is, is clear that the, the learning never stops, right? It's not like you stop learning once you get your PhD or you get your job. And the, this, this, this is the life thing is funny is the, the more you know, the more you realize that you don't know. And so you, you just keep going. So and that's, that's a good thing. That's an exciting opportunity. So thank you. Um, if I can say one more thing about that, Chris, you mentioned something about like the benefit of that private practice, you kind of get to follow what you're interested in. And we definitely have that feeling where like we kind of needed to do certain things, but ultimately we really want to try and create this environment where people can become subject matter experts in the areas that they're really excited about. And one of the ways that helps me learn are our clients. So if we have a participant that has a situation that's new to me, 
sometimes that is the flag that says, okay, I need to go outside of myself. I need to go look into the research. I need to listen to a podcast. I need to go talk to another clinician about how I can help this family specifically. So it's another cool way to kind of advance your um, breadth of experience by just the people you're serving and like what they need. So that's kind of an exciting part about the field too, is like, oh, I have this new situation. I don't know how to deal with it. Let me go figure it out. Let me go find the research or talk to someone. Um, and that's a really great way to continue to keep your motivation to learn new things is that you're really helping someone specifically right then. Right. And it's super important to be consulting with other people like all the time, because you're never going to know what you don't know. Right. And and also like in the field of marriage and family therapy, we are required to, in order to maintain our licensure, we have to get so many continuing education hours too. So that part is kind of the same across the board for very many people here. And I think it's also good that it's okay not to know. You know, I, I know there are plenty of times in my life where I, I, I had to fake the funk and pretended like I knew something. And, and it, how do you know something unless you ask? So um, just not knowing something is a, a learning opportunity for, for all of us, including our students. Um, all right, so we have two more questions in about, I think about five minutes. So I think I'm just gonna um, open this, this question up for anybody that would like to contribute, maybe not all, because I definitely wanna get to the last question, which is one piece of advice that you all have. Um, but what recommendations do you have for students who aren't interested in getting a master's degree or a PhD, a doctorate degree um, in your field? So social work, social services, whatever that might be. I say that, um, you know, the future of work is credential. So there's evidence that um, companies right now, uh, I, I know that the, the, there's this idea like the higher degree you have, the more com competitive you are. I mean, that, I think that may be true to some extent, right? Areas that are required for you to have a master's or, or, or PhD. But in the workforce, um, there's a lot of stuff going on now where you can get certificates, you can get um, um, uh, you know, uh, badges, um, and, and, and these other, what they call micro credentials. So my advice is um, that if you are interested in social services and the bachelor's degree is where you're at, um, there's always ways to look for how can you get trained in, in these other little specialties that kind of give you a leg up um, in your expertise, right? Can you take um, a specialized writing course or can you take an IT course, like something that where you're proficient in technology? Um, I think for social services, social behavioral sciences as a degree, there's this myth that we have to get stuck in like social services jobs. And that's simply not true. Google is hiring sociologists and psychologists and anthropologists, right? Um, here in San Diego, Booz Allen Hamilton has a liberal arts internship. They are looking for liberal arts majors to work in Booz Allen Hamilton, which they um, do um, defense contracts for the military. Um, so the, I think one of the valuable things about social and behavioral science degrees is the um, breadth of, of, of jobs that may, that may be accessible to you um, and being able to find like these unique skills that you can, can gather, right? What, how about graphic design, like social media marketing, marketing research, um, that's also, every company has a marketing research arm to it. HR, right? Hiring people. Every company has a HR. So um, I think it's wide open and uh, if you're not feeling the, the advanced degree, there's, there's ways to get these micro credentials. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I would love to say that, um, you know, at Easter Seals, our, our service line, we provide services for um, families. And the, the main role there is the behavior interventionist. And that's our entry level role. That's how I got into this field. Um, and so that does not require a bachelor's degree. Um, so it definitely doesn't require a master's degree. It requires some experience, um, some college credits and some level of experience with working with children. Um, but it is the entry level position. So I would say if you're interested in learning how why humans sometimes do the things they do uh, more and less than others and what motivates people and how to um, adjust the environment for people's success. Like these are skills that you're gonna use in any other field you end up going to. So I would, 
um, welcome you to reach out to me if you're interested in a part-time position as a behavior interventionist working with kids um, and young adults and teens as well. Um, but yeah, there's lots of opportunity in my field for people without their master's degree, for sure. Uh, I think we will go to the last question. Chris, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just say in this field too, there's also entry level positions. Uh, you know, they're going to be labeled as counselors in some of the postings that you might read. Uh, but in a lot of the community community based agencies like Easter Seals or uh, Fred Finch or New Alternatives, you know, they have very many positions that are entry level for bachelor's level uh, workers. And you're basically like, you know, some of them going to develop like the relationships with some of the kids or other individuals who work, who live at those places or who receive services there. So it's a really great way, I think, to like work on your relationship developing uh, skills and really learn more about the field too, because you're going to be interfacing with a lot of different professionals, like social workers or therapists or doctors or teachers. And so you really get to find out a lot more about the field while you're there. Thank you. Yeah. And once again, the question was, was, uh, what recommendations do you have for students who aren't interested in getting a master's or a doctorate in, in the field? So, so great advice from our panelists. And last but not least, as, so we can leave some time for questions from our students. Uh, what is one last piece of advice you would like to share with our students as they begin thinking about their careers? Anyone at all? I'll say right now, take advantage of the college's resources, internships. You'll see job descriptions that are like, oh, experience needed. And you're like, how do I experience? Internships are a great way to get experiences. Um, do you all have service learning, right, on campus at Southwestern? Yes. If your professor offers service learning, take it. Take that opportunity in social services to to, to see what an, a nonprofit organization is like and, and, and to log those uh, volunteer hours. But I'm telling you, when you put it on your resume, you don't have to say volunteer. Right? You just say, my experience is I've done this, this, and this. What are the skills that, you know, what did I do? What were the tasks that I will, you know, have experience in? So take the opportunity now to, to, to uh, connect with the resources that are on campus to help you. Genesis and her career uh, uh, leadership, and then Ms. Brandy Bass, like work-based learning. How can you take advantage of what you have right now um, to add to your resume, to add to the skills so that when you're ready and you're transferring and you are applying to jobs, you can say you have experience. That's, that's my advice. Excellent, excellent advice. Uh, same question. What is one last piece of advice you would like to share with our students as they begin thinking about their careers? Just say, allow yourself to not know everything that you wanna do right away. Like in addition to yes, use the services that are provided at school because they are fantastic services and they're there for a reason. There's plenty of people there who want to help, but be okay with like not knowing the answer right away and not expecting that you should be at a certain place by a certain age. Because you know, life isn't necessarily linear and learning isn't linear and your career won't be linear probably. So experiment, find out a lot, a lot more. Maybe get a random job that you didn't expect that you would ever take, but you know what? You would have given yourself a chance to learn. So that's my advice. Do something new, use services, try to have some fun too. Mm -hmm. Have some fun and be afraid to, not to make mistakes, right? right. In right. psychology, we say mistakes are just another opportunity for learning. So <laughs> you find out what you don't want to do. It's just as important as finding out what you do want to do. Right. That's uh, right. Yeah. And then Kathleen, last question. Yeah. What is one last piece of advice you would like to share with our students as they begin thinking about their careers? Yeah. I like to say there is no failure. It's only information. And, um, you know, try and lean into that. Um, but I would also like great advice and to add on to that, I would say, take time to kind of figure out what, what's important to you and what do you value? What's your mission? Like whatever the, the employer's mission is, does it match with yours? Because, you know, having a job is most often the necessary evil, but it also can be a really fulfilling thing. And even though I love my job, I love my company. I've been here for almost 10 years now. Um, it still sucks sometimes. Like it's still really rough. Uh, I just got into this new director position. I was an associate before that, and I've been working way 
too many hours and my balance is all out of whack, but I know that my values match with the company. And so even when there's certain situations where I'm like, why, why, why did they do that? You know, what are they doing? I disagree with that decision. I still know that for the most part, there's enough overlap that my values match this company's values. So it keeps me going through those rough times that you will definitely hit, especially when you're in the helping field. Um, it's it's a, always a challenge, um, but I'm motivated internally because I'm doing things that I care about and that excite me. So I would say, you know, taking all of the advice and just like, doing daring things, don't be afraid to make mistakes and really figure out what's important to you um, so that no matter, you know, the crappy situation you might find yourself in or a job, you can still have that redeeming moment of like, I'm doing something that really matters to me. Yeah, thank you. Great advice. I've been very impressed with the experiences of our, our panelists and what they have shared uh, and, and their, their, their willingness to put themselves out there, try new things. So I think one common theme that we're seeing is, is, is there a, a multitude of opportunities around you uh, and a multitude, many, many people willing to help you, but at the same time, you got to take the step forward and find those things. Like you know, the career path doesn't come to you when you're sitting on your couch, right? You got to try new things. And you showing up for this panel, this, this, this seminar today, is certainly a step in the right direction. So I commend everybody for being here today. Um, at this time, I think we would like to open it up to any questions from the students that they might have uh, for any of our panelists. I just want to verify, you guys are seeing my screen now, right? Yes, perfect. So these are the top questions that came in. A lot of it has to do about gaining experience right now. Um, so I'm going to, the first one here is what is the best part-time job to gain experience in the behavioral sciences field? And Kathleen's waving her hand, so I'll let Kathleen go for it. I, I mean, I'm going to be biased, but I do think a behavior interventionist role is an amazing opportunity to understand get, get, dip your toe in the water kind of thing. Um, and like I said, it will teach you a lot of things about behavior management, motivation, um, you know, how people learn and just understand how to communicate. So it'll give you a lot of really great um, foundational skills and it's part-time and um, it starts at $20 an hour. So that's pretty great. We just increased our, our um, pay. Um, because we are in a real need um, for behavior interventionists. So if you're interested, you know, it is a lot of work and it's a big commitment, but we can do it in smaller doses and little nuggets while you're growing and, and working um, in your, your academic career as well. Go ahead, Chris. If, I, if I could answer the second question, just because I have to go, I have a three o'clock. Uh, so what education work experience would you recommend for somebody desiring to be a psychologist in mental health, specifically in a behavioral health hospital? So first with that question, if you want to be a psychologist, uh, you do have to finish your bachelor's and then get, uh, you could probably go right into a PhD that may have like a master's program embedded in it, or you could even get a master's degree in MFT, LCSW, and then go get a PhD afterwards. Like the road to a PhD isn't necessarily always like you do this one particular thing. Uh, but to work in a behavioral health hospital and you want to be a psychologist, you do need to go and get a PhD. Uh, the behavioral health hospitals do have a lot of different jobs for different professionals too, like social workers and marriage and family therapists providing services to people with uh, various mental health needs and maybe even substance abuse needs. That's my advice for that. Thank you, Chris. Um, our panelists have talked a great deal today about making use of the part-time jobs, the volunteer opportunities that present themselves to you, knowing that every experience is beneficial. Um, but I, I'm gonna ask this third question as well, just in case anyone has any additional thoughts to share on it. If what, if any, kind of volunteer jobs, part-time jobs would benefit me to get experience to eventually go into that field before going, before finishing school? Anyone want to take that one? Can I answer that? Absolutely, Chris. <laughs> go for it. 
you know, I, uh, if, well, first of all, if you want to teach at a community college, the minimum is a master's degree. Um, but I think some of the most valuable uh, experiences that I had to become a teacher or a community college professor were uh, volunteer teaching when I was still in college. You know, I volunteered at the at the local um, K through six class and after school reading programs and 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 had no idea that I was eventually going to be teaching at Southwestern College. But I mean, if you could teach two year olds, you can teach twenty two year olds. Well, not maybe not two, but six <laughs> or seven or eight or however old they are. Um, so, you know, there is opportunity for that. Tutoring is a great uh, way to become a great teacher as well. Um, you know, and you'll, I, I always like to say, you'll never know somebody something well until you have to teach it to somebody else. So by, by doing that, you are refining your own skills, so. Perfect, so there's one last question I wanna ask because it's, it's the next highest one is, what kind of jobs are available for applied sociology majors? Are there government jobs and non-government government jobs available? Uh, Tal, you spoke a little bit towards this already. Do you mind sharing a little bit more? Yeah, so I love um, uh, the idea of like applied sociology, right? So uh, it's like, what are some practical things that you can get from uh, the degree? And, um, and, and the person mentioned government and non-governmental jobs. And that's actually like, you know, that's, that's, that's definitely a big employer, right? Governments are huge employers of um, sociology majors. But the thing I want students to remember now is if you go into um, like Indeed or these other job search areas, there's a, there are a lot of companies that are applying uh, or excuse me, uh, accepting sociology majors and the applied part is the research. The ability to do research is so valuable. Um, marketing teams need researchers, product development need researchers, um, uh, film companies need researchers. So I would say if you want, if you're interested in applied sociology, that ability to um, do focus groups, to create surveys, to um, analyze data, to run uh, data analysis and uh, understand the statistics and trends in, in human behavior. I think that's the most powerful skill uh, in applied sociology. Um, and, uh, you know, so seek those types of internships and entry level jobs. Uh, and, and you don't have to look for the sociology degree uh, in the, the job description, but anything that has to do with like research and, and development and, and interviewing skills and, and whatnot. Amen. <laughs> awesome. With that, we're going to have one last poll question. You uh, offer, our panelists offered some incredible insight to you all as students. I wanted to hear from you. One last poll question. What is one career tip that you will use in your career journey? So go ahead and type that into slido.com. Remember the event code is SWC panel. Go ahead and type that in. Um, a couple of things that are happening in the chat. Kathleen shared some insight about the part-time positions that are available all over San Diego and shared her contact information. Um, there's also a survey in the chat um, get, where you can offer your feedback on this panel for all of us. So find a mentor, never thought of that. Use school services more, absolutely. Reach out and look for internships and part-time jobs. Yes, take advantage of volunteer and part-time work. Take elective classes. This is great, I love it. Awesome. Keep them coming, folks. And then with that, Kathleen, it looks like everybody is thankful for your plug. <laughs> We have just a few more minutes. I want to let you know that I'm Genesis and I am the internship job developer here at Southwestern. I want to share with you a little bit about the services that we offer. In addition to offering these panels, we are responsible for helping prepare you for the workforce. And so what you have here in front of us is all of our services. You can certainly do internships through our cooperative work experience program, but we're here to help you with your resumes, your cover letters, as you apply for positions like the one that Kathleen is sharing with you today. Um, we'll help you with your interview techniques and we have tons of events just like this one where we can support you and connect you a little closer to your career goals. Uh, 
jobs like the one Kathleen is offering are, are posted within Handshake, which is our online job board and career resource center. So please feel free to check that out. It's available within my SW, your my SWC portal, and it is um, under campus apps located as Handshake. It's also an app in your phone. So if you would like to start applying for jobs and internships, the first place to look should be Handshake. And just to let you know, we're here to support you. So please feel free to contact us at Student Employment Services. That is SES at SWCCD.edu. Uh, and we're also all over social media. So if you want to know more about what it is that we do or want some career tips and advice, please feel free to connect with us. These are all of our social media outlets. And lastly, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here and sharing your expertise and advice. Uh, students, please feel free to drop some emojis and reactions um, and share with them our appreciation for being here. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and thank you for being here. And we hope you gained a lot out of today's presentation. I've never been referred to as fire, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gave me energy for the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Have a good day. <laughs>